Hey, Startup Nation, I am so glad you came back to join us for another edition of The Startup Life. You clearly are ready to get the tools you need to get ahead of the competition. Go ahead and give us a five-star rating while you're here. Now, if you're looking for an ad-free experience, go ahead and sign up for our Patreon page, where you will get exclusive content and access to our digital products that we're beginning to launch. The link is there in the show notes. And if you want to ask questions directly to some of our guests, follow the Startup Life Podcast Club on Clubhouse as some of our conversations will start to happen there. But back to the task at hand. Are you ready to level up? Of course you are. Get ready as the Startup Life Podcast begins now. It's time to be about that life. The Startup Life. Here's your host, Dominic Lawson. All right, Startup Nation, so I hope you're ready to receive some value today. My name is Dominic Lawson, and this is The Startup Life, the show for entrepreneurs and career-minded professionals. You know, Startup Nation, we hear all the time, you know, uh, the startup failure rate is is a high one, right? But how do we figure out how to kind of circumvent that? How can we correct uh, that course? Well, I think we have uh, a um, fantastic guest that can help us out with that. He is uh, a Howard H. Stevenson, professor of business administration at Harvard Business School, and he's also the author of Why Startups Fail, a new roadmap for entrepreneurial success. He is Tom Eisenman. Tom, how are you? Good, sir. I'm doing great. Thanks for hosting, Dominic. Oh, no worries. It's our pleasure. Thank you so much for coming on uh, the show. And, you know, we're definitely going to talk about, you know, Why Startups Fail, your book, your amazing book. Uh, stuff like that. Startup Nation, if you're ready to purchase that book, we have a link there in the show notes for easy access if you listen to the replay on the podcast. Uh, But Tom, before we kind of get started, uh, if you would, you know, the past year, 12, 13 months, 14 months, however you look at it, has has been one crazy one, uh, right? And, you know, you have uh, students there at Harvard Business School uh, and, and stuff like that. I guess I'm just curious, you know, over the past year or so, uh, what are what have you been imparting on your your students over the past year? You, you know, you're you're generating and creating the next uh, leaders of Fortune 500 companies there and startups there. So I guess I'm just curious, what's a lesson that you're sharing with your class, uh, your classes these days or your students rather these days when it comes to the past uh, 14 months? Yeah, so it's it's tough times. I mean, this this has um, the pandemic has crushed lots and lots of new ventures. Um probably hundreds of thousands of them. And, and, uh, and that's depressing, but at the same time, there's been a, a surge in, in new ventures launched. So it's a little confusing, right? Um, I mean, on one hand, a lot of businesses dying on a, on a, on, a, on the other hand, a lot of them being born. Right. And so what I've been telling the MBAs is that, um, it, it, there's a chance that if we look two years out from here, um, three, five years, that we're going to see a flowering of of amazing businesses that were launched at exactly this time. You know, we we went through something very similar with the Great Recession of two thousand eight, two thousand nine, right? right. And, and and in that time frame, um, it basically um, people everywhere, um, business school, um, coming out of college, wherever, um, uh, jobs were tight. The kinds of jobs an MBA would normally go for simply weren't available. So a lot of MBAs, uh, almost by necessity, were working on a startup idea. They didn't have um, they, they didn't have other avenues, and so you had a lot of people working on ideas, and they had a lot of time to do it. and And being in school is a particularly good time to be testing an idea. Um, you got time to stretch out. Absolutely. You get a lot of people who can give you good feedback, and so these ideas were plentiful and they were well developed. At the same time, coming out of that recession, um, the investment dried up. Like as it often does around a recession, and 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 as it did, um, and certainly in the early part of, of of this pandemic, and so the things that got funded by their nature were better, right? So, sort of mm-hmm. only so many things are going to get funded. The stronger ideas got funded, and there were a lot of strong ideas, and of course there were fewer ventures actually launched that that in this case um, raised venture capital or or professional um, investment. And so there was less competition. Mm. So, so these businesses launched in say 2009, you know, some of, some of them coming out of Harvard business school, uh, grew up to be tigers, um, uh, Cloudflare, which has a $27 billion valuation, right. rent the runway and, and Birchbox and blue apron and, 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 um, Oscar health and so forth. So, so what I'm telling my students now is there's a chance we'll see the same thing coming out of the pandemic that, 
Um, a lot of you will come up with great ideas. You'll get time to develop them. Uh, they'll get screened by investors who are picky um, and, and you'll be facing less competition. For sure. You know, we, we've been hearing that from a lot of our, our, our guests lately that, you know, uh, like, you know, the 2008 recession and stuff like that, even now that some of those comparisons, but it's also kind of, you know, uh, lots of opportunity there. You know what I mean? Obviously not trying to like, you know, profit off somebody's, you know, whatever, you know, misfortunes and stuff like that. But when we have these downturns, uh, you know, there's definitely opportunity there. Quick follow up question, if I may, because another thing we've been hearing from a lot of guests over the past uh, about the past 14 months and stuff like that is to not only worry about how to kind of circumvent and I mean, not necessarily circumvent how to navigate the waters, the troubled waters now, but also how to come out of it uh, better than ever. You know what I mean? Like that duality of not just preparing for getting out of the hole now, but also thinking about and and contemplating about what you want to be after the downturn you have any commentary on that any insight on that as well, yeah Tom? yeah the um a, a lot of the dynamics of the great recession i think could play out again but there's something unique about this pandemic that sure. i think is even better for aspiring entrepreneurs it's actually twofold if you sort of look at the demand side um the, op- the nature of the opportunity the pandemic has changed the way we work and live mm. in very fundamental ways. And those changes, um, change that big means opportunity for the entrepreneur. So that wasn't the case coming out of the Great Recession, right? It's sort of back to business as usual. Um, you know, the, the housing market um, and lending markets got beaten up. But, but otherwise, we sort of worked and lived the way we always had. This is different. And and it also affects not only the demand side, but the supply side. So um, you and I right now are very comfortable doing this over Zoom. A lot of your listeners have been working over Zoom um, and uh, and entrepreneurs everywhere have got dispersed teams that are chugging along, building product, uh, marketing product, and, and we've learned how to make it work. And what that does is I think it opens up opportunity for entrepreneurs all over the place. You know, you no longer have to be in New York City or, or, or San Francisco or Seattle if you're a tech entrepreneur. You can, you can put that tech business anywhere because, because your developers, your engineers are, are going to be anywhere. And, and, and every business, almost every business these days has some kind of tech element to it, a website for marketing and, and so forth. So, so I think that's quite important. So yeah, it's, um, I, I think it's, it's very different this time around and, and, and full of opportunity. For sure. You know, in, in that, that same vein, another follow up question, because I, I guess I'm just I'm, I'm going down a rabbit hole here, Tom. So just bear with me, because uh, you bring up some interesting points, because, you know, you know, uh, one of the things that we're kind of seeing now a lot of times with a lot of startup founders uh, is that they're starting to notice that, you know, with, you know, Zoom and the tech element and and and, and uh, you know, Google workstations like, you know, Google Docs and stuff like that. You can transfer files and stuff like that pretty quickly. That a lot of startup founders are starting to think, you know what? Maybe I don't have to necessarily be. And you talked about not necessarily being in Silicon Valley or in New York and stuff like that. Maybe being in a Utah, being in a Atlanta, Georgia, being in a Nashville. But we're starting to see a lot of startup founders say, you know what? Maybe I want to live out in rural Tennessee because that's where kind of where hmm. we are. Maybe I want to live out in rural Tennessee and, and have my my uh my startup there you know a lot of the stuff i can do remotely and stuff like that and and when you go to like a zip a zip recruiter or indeed and you see a lot of new jobs that say you know remote 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 do you see that trend increasing as well tom no no doubt about it um you know and i think time will tell whether um the edge you get from being able to recruit right. from a literally a worldwide talent pool um, how that compares with the edge you get from having a team co-located, um, you, you know, literally physically together, um, whether virtually together, sort of just running, running uh, two-way conferencing in the background is if, if somebody's building product or marketing or figuring out sales plans, is that a good enough substitute for, for what people can normally do, which is just leaning over and talking to the person at the desk next to them. I, I think we're going to learn a lot. We don't, I don't. I think we don't know it all yet. Of course. But, um, I, would, I would guess um, people are creative and and they're going to they're very adaptable. So I think we're going to adapt to to this remote model, For and sure. and 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 rural Tennessee would work great. 
Absolutely. Absolutely. Definitely uh, believe that and, and think that as well. Once again, Startup Nation, we're talking to Tom Eisenman, the author of Why Startups Fail, A New Roadmap for Entrepreneurial Success. And if you're ready to get this book, Startup Nation, and I'm going to tell you right now, I highly recommend uh, you get this book. This is for startup founders. And even if you're a, a 10 year, 15 year season uh, veteran in the entrepreneurial game, you definitely want to get Why Startups Fail. We have a link there in the show notes for easy access if you listen to the replay on the podcast and if you're listening on radio just wherever you get your favorite uh book so let's kind of dive into the book uh tom because you know in the book you know you have these amazing stories uh you know from all the data that you've created uh that you've kind of uh have in the book and stuff like that and i'm curious about uh the uh you have like six points right the six distinct patterns of why startups fails can you share that with us a little bit Sure. Um, yeah, the, the, the argument of the book is that um, failure is complicated. Absolutely. Like we, 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 we tend to oversimplify. Um, a lot of investors and entrepreneurs will talk about jockey and horse, the mm. uh, uh, jockey being the founder and the horse being the concept. And uh, there's a, a, a predisposition, I think, to blame it on a bad jockey, um, sometimes a slow horse, but often a bad jockey. And sometimes that's ca- the case, but y- usually it's uh, much more complicated. You know, it isn't just the founder, it's the other team members, it's the investors. Um, so there's often partners in the background that are contributing marketing channels or, or, or technology. And and, um, and so what the book does is says, yes, it's complicated, but it's not, um, it's not beyond recognizing some recurring patterns. And, and what the six patterns you talk about, three of them apply to early stage startups. So right. um, new ventures that are just getting going first few first couple of years. And then three of them apply um, surprisingly later stage resource rich startups um, that have got product market fit. They've got a product that's working still fail with alarming regularity. You know, something like two out of three early stage startups will fail and one out of three later stage startups will still fail. And, and, um, and again, there's, um, th- th- there's three patterns that I've identified behind the late stage failures. So I can go into... Uh, do you want me to dive into each of them? Sorry, I was on mute there. Absolutely, I would love that. Um, okay, so I'll I'll start with early stage. Sure. And um, the the three patterns are what I call good idea, bad bedfellows is the first one, and and the notion there is some entrepreneurs come up with a good concept. They can actually test the concept. A lot of your listeners will be familiar with lean startup ideas, right? Sort of testing a, a new venture uh, with a minimum viable product, sort of putting it out there, getting quick customer feedback, running an, essentially an experiment um, and wasting no more time or money than you need to sort of get reliable feedback from potential customers. Um, but notwithstanding having a good idea, they just can't get the the big T team together. Like not just, not just the team members, but the founders, the investors, everybody that's got to lend resources, time or, or, or or um, or effort to the venture, and they just can't. It's you have dysfunctional relationships, and you can you got a good idea, but you can't execute on it. That's right. the first pattern, and and I'll I'll explain a little bit why and what you can do about it for each of these. Sure, but but just to sort of tee them up, the second one um, I I call a false start, just like uh, an athlete, track and field or or swimming. You know, right. just sort of somebody jumps literally jumps the gun, and gets penalized, and what's happening there is. Um, entrepreneurs just want to get going. They have this, um, and they need a bias for action. A- and um, and every impulse in their body says, um, build it and sell it fast. Like, let's get going. Mm-hmm. I only have so much capital I've raised. I only have so much time. I got to get it out there. And, and, and these entrepreneurs skip some upfront steps, um, some basic research, um, figuring out, is there a, a strong unmet customer need? Um, who's the target customer? What's their need? What's the problem with existing solutions that address that need? And, and how can we come up with something differentiated? They don't test multiple solutions. They dive right in. They got an idea burning bright about what they want to do. Right. If you will, a problem solution pair, right? Here's my problem. Here's my solution. I'm going to build it. I'm going to get going. And sometimes it works, but it's often the case if you haven't done the upfront research that that first version misses the mark. And you can pivot away and sort of change the features or target a new customer segment, but you've wasted like a false start. 
you've you've wasted time and you've wasted money if you've raised a year's worth of capital um, burn rate runway um, and you spend the first four months on a version that didn't work boy you've really reduced your survival odds so that's number two and then number three is a tricky one it's it I call it a false positive just just like covid testing right we all we all learned a lot about false positives and false negatives right um, and and here, the entrepreneur is seduced by very strong demand from early adopters. And, and that's easy um, to fall victim to. And I wouldn't call it victim. You need the early adopters. Nobody can build a business without getting the early adopters on board. But it's often the case that the needs of the early adopters are different from the needs of the mainstream customers. You, in most businesses, you need both. You need the early adopters to come on board and spread the word. You need the mainstream customers to give you the volume to turn it into a, a, a thriving business. And if the needs differ, you can go too far, build essentially build the wrong product, position mm-hmm. your product wrong in ways that don't connect with the mainstream. And then you stall. And, and, and again, you can pivot back in the right direction, but you've wasted time and you've wasted money. So those, those are the three patterns, early stage. Got you. Got you. No, I, I appreciate that. You know, if, if you would kind of dive into that that product part, because we see a lot of uh, entrepreneurs kind of get not necessarily stuck at that part. But that that seems like a, you know, like a one that really kind of, you know, kind of stymies their their growth or their moving forward, because either a, you know, you talked about either be the wrong product or it be the wrong product for the, you know, for the right target audience. Can you talk about that just a little bit more in depth, Tom? Yeah. So um, so so I think entrepreneurs need to put a designer's hat on gotcha. um, at the beginning. And, and by designer, I think a lot of people, when they think design, will think of visual design. And that's that can be very important. But but I'm, I'm talking about the kind of design that the tech world would call it a user experience designer. Somebody who really gets into the head of the customer, figures out what their needs are, um, how they buy a product, how they're going to use a product, and how to design a product in ways a whole experience, you know, from from shopping for it to getting um, after sales service that that sort of thinks up and makes sense to the consumer, um, and and that's a really um, uh, there's skills there they can be learned. Um, there's a there's a ton of great books and podcasts out there on on how to basically as an entrepreneur think like a designer. Right. And and um, um, the the process um, usually starts. And, and again, folks who've who've heard about Lean Startup will be familiar with Steve Blank, who's one of the the gurus that got the Lean Startup movement going. He talks about customer discovery, right? And and to him, the core of customer discovery is lots and lots of interviews with with potential customers to basically find out what are their problems um, and how do we segment these customers and, and what are the problems with existing solutions they're using. And uh, this is um, super important, but also pretty hard to do well because right. um, the entrepreneur's impulse is going to be to pitch, right? Every entrepreneur gets excited about their idea and uh, they, it's so easy to turn that interview into a pitch session where like, hey, this is what I'm thinking of. What do you think? And, and the response from that potential customer is going to be more often than not, that's a pretty good idea. I like that. Um, do they really like it? Maybe. Um, maybe they're just trying to make you feel good. Um, that people don't want to hurt your feelings. And sometimes you seem so weird and intense as an entrepreneur, they just want you to go away. So right. um, if, I t- if, I, if I tell you I like your thing, um, that, that may uh, send you packing. And, and so it's easy to pitch when you should be listening. It's easy to go with leading questions. And, you know, one of the um, examples profiled in the book is an online dating site. Right. And, and, you know, imagine the kinds of questions um, you might ask somebody about um, uh, uh, about their dating habits. You know, you might ask if you were interviewing a customer, hey, um, I see you're a match subscriber. You've told me you're a match subscriber. Don't you have trouble sorting and searching through the stale profiles that are there, people that really aren't active on the site anymore? That's a leading question. Like you've 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 sort of told them, and you know the answer is going to be yeah, I guess so. Right. You know, much better question is just sort of um, let's you know, can you tell me about your experience searching for a romantic partner on Match? You know, and let them tell you that the profiles are stale. You don't put the don't put the idea in their head. So there's all sorts of ways you can get the interviewing wrong, 
And there's other techniques. Um, they don't work for every business. Uh, focus groups, if the product has a big emotional content, dating would be a great example. Right. Um, if you can get six or eight people in a room um, and get them to start telling stories to each other and trigger memories and associations, you can, you can really learn some things that you might not be able to get in a one-on-one -on -one interview. Really hard to run a focus group well, but you can get some, some powerful insight from it. Um, ethnography, which is a, a fancy term for watching people in real life do the thing, you know, so imagine you're designing an online grocery service and you go to a grocery store and you literally watch people go up and down the aisles and sort of, what do they look at? Um, what order do they do things? Are they carrying a list with them and so on and so forth. So there's, there's all these techniques for really understanding the customer. They're, they're techniques that are familiar to designers. Um, the designer will take all that input and they'll develop um, what um, product people and marketers will call a persona. Um, it, you know, it, and then this will be an individual, you'll give the individual a name, a whole history and background uh, quotes. It's, a, it's, a, it's an imaginary person, but uh, for your whole team, it gets in their head, both the marketing side and the product side. You know, we are, we are designing this product for Mary and Mary wouldn't like that. Uh, Mary's a fictional character, but she's, she's, she's come to life for your team and helped you design a product that makes sense. And then um, along the way, the designer will do lots and lots of prototyping of lots of different solutions. A mistake that, that lots of entrepreneurs make is they dive right in. They become emotionally attached to mm. their vision for what the product should be. Right. And usually there are a lot of different ways to solve the problem and, and, and um, takes discipline to not um, become too attached to one way. And, and, you know, and, and so you, you, you come up with rough prototypes, you get customer feedback on them, and then you sort down to the version you really want to work on and build. And only then should you really be going for what this lean startup folks would be calling a, a minimum viable product. It's actually the last, the MVP, the minimum viable product is right. the last step in a design process. For sure. For sure. No, we're definitely familiar <laughs> With the MVP, I want to go back really quickly before we get to the the uh, the other three, the late stage uh, failures like you know speed traps, help wanted, and cascade miracles. But I want to go back to bedfellows really quickly. You talked about earlier as far as like uh, you know when it talked about that pro that um, interviews doing with the product stuff like that, focus groups and stuff like that. And when you talk about bad bedfellows, is that something that should be applied there as well? Doing like multiple interviews with a team when it comes to investors, teammates things of that nature. And what, and I know yeah. it probably varies per industry, but what are some of those questions that you should be asking to kind of circumvent that part, the bad bell fellows? Yeah. So, so there's, there's some um, recurring um, mistakes that entrepreneurs will make here. There are mistakes with picking a co-founder. I could come back to that. Right. But um, a, a tricky one is the profile of the first team members, the first employees you're going to hire. And, um, a, a really hard choice every entrepreneur has to make is how to balance skill, specialized skill, knowing how to do a function. Um, you, you know, we're going to do performance market, digital marketing, and this person's an expert at digital marketing. Um, this person has sold before, you know, sort of knows how to sell a long cycle product though, where it takes multiple recurring connections um, um, versus attitude, skill versus attitude. And in any early stage venture, um, um, it's basically chaotic and, and um, right. um, things are shifting all the time and all of the employees need the ability to sort of drop whatever they're doing and, and move to where the problem is and sort of pitch in and, and do that without batting an eye and, and do it well. So you need generalists early on, but you also need specialists. Right. And, and, and that's the trick is sort of. I mean, in the perfect world, you find a specialist who's flexible, who, who can adapt to the chaotic rhythms of, of startup life. Um, they can be hard to find because basically often people will hone their specialist skills in a big company, um, which doesn't have these, these, um, these um, wild rhythms. And, sure. um, and, and so that's, um, that, that's it. That's, that's really, um, and, and it gets especially complicated, Dominic, when, um, the entrepreneur themselves, the, the founder themselves lacks domain expertise. Mm. Um, and, and sometimes some startups, that's much more important than others. Um, one of the examples in the book is of a, a fashion, an apparel company. Um, two, two former students of mine, right. um, the concept was um, they were both having trouble finding a work wardrobe. So they wanted to design 
affordable, stylish, and uh, this is the important part, better fitting wardrobes for young professional women. Uh, and, and it was hard for them to find all three. They could find expensive stuff that fit great because you take it to a tailor, you know, and, you know, you're out a thousand dollars. They could find $300 stuff that would sort of hang um, in a sloppy way on you and couldn't be tailored. Right. Uh, and they couldn't find anything in between. So they set out to build that business themselves. The, the secret sauce was... Um, sizing like men's suiting. You know, when we buy clothes, you get a chest measurement and sleeve length and so forth. Women's um, apparel comes in the size eight, the size 10, 12, whatever, you, you know, and if you got big hips or, um, you know, uh, et cetera, et cetera, right. uh, stuff's not going to fit well. And um, they hadn't, they had a great idea. This is a good idea. Um, they tested it. They did all the MVP stuff, um, got fantastic validation for the concept, sort of got pre-orders, ran samples so they showed people samples at trunk shows and and uh it was all working um they tried to raise a million and a half they only raised a million they knew they didn't have domain expertise themselves neither of them had worked in design and manufacturing of apparel right so um they figured they better go out and hire specialists who knew how to do that and it turns out that um, apparel manufacturing and design is really complicated. There's lots of steps and they all have to fit together perfectly. Fabric sourcing, sample cutting, you know, sample making, um, quality control. Um, it goes on and on. There's like seven or eight really important steps. So they hired people who knew how to do those steps out of, out of existing apparel companies. And these folks, um, when trouble would happen, uh, they would sit on their hands and say, I, I don't know how to fix that. Not mm-hmm. my job. Um, right. I, I'm, I'm the uh, quality control person. I'm not the, I'm not the fabric sourcer. You know, so they made some pretty basic mistakes. Like there's certain, they thought they were um, sourcing the same fabric as an earlier um, sample they'd created. It turns out fabrics have different elasticity, you know, and it just w- won't fit as well. They had a lining in their jackets uh, that was pink. And, and when you sweat, um, the, the pink dye would come off and so basically stain the garment. And, and, you know, and, and somebody in the, so, some of these so-called um, experienced folks on their team should have known that or should have said something, but they came from companies where you don't speak up, like mm, basically, right. um, you know, not the, not the way to make a startup work. So, so that is an example of a startup where domain expertise was super important. Absolutely. Not true everywhere. Right. I mean, I think if you could sort of dig inside the, the startup of Instagram, you'd find that you didn't need um, anybody there who was a, a brilliantly experienced person at sort of how people take photos and, right. and sort of put filters on photos. You know, they just had a good idea. They built the thing and it took off like a rocket. So sometimes you need industry expertise and sometimes you don't. It's really important as an entrepreneur to know when you need it. And if you don't have it, um, then, you know, can you find a co-founder who will bring it? Can you find team members who will bring it and bring the right attitude? Can you hire and um, bring on board investors um, who, who've got experience in the business and can connect you with the right people? All right, Startup Nation. So we're going to go ahead and take a quick break. We got to pay some bills. Once again, my name is Dominic Lawson, and you're listening to The Startup Life. Hey, Startup Nation, I think we can all agree that 2020 was more or less a dumpster fire, right? I mean, come on, on top of surviving a worldwide pandemic, good friends and family of mine lost their jobs, had their hours cut, or went out of business altogether. Yet many of these same people are talented creatives, web developers, photographers, graphic designers, SEO specialists, and writers with solid, marketable, in-demand skills. So I've turned them onto Hectic. Hectic is an all-in-one business management software built specifically for freelancers who are just getting started or looking to take their freelance business to the next level. Hectic is everything a freelancer needs to get started, from an easy-to-use contracts and proposal builder to client management and project tracking to expenses and invoicing that features click-to-play technology that makes it quick and easy for freelancers to get paid. And we all want to get paid, Startup Nation. Built specifically for freelancers, Hectic is everything you need to get started. Visit gethecticapp.com forward slash the startup life now to learn more and start for free. Yep. 
adding your first client on the platform will always be free. And if you sign up through gethecticapp.com forward slash the startup life, you'll be supporting me and this podcast because who couldn't use a little support these days, Startup Nation? Visit gethecticapp.com forward slash the startup life to find everything you need to start or grow your freelancing business today and put those in-demand skills to good use in the way you've always dreamed of. The link is there in the show notes. All right, Startup Nation, welcome back as we continue our conversation with today's guest here on The Startup Life. For sure, for sure. There, wow, there's a lot to unpack there, Tom, from... Uh, you know, you, you talked about the 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 generalist and the specialist uh, dynamic, right? We had a conversation with Mark Randolph, the uh, co-founder and first CEO of Netflix, and he talked about that very thing. Uh, but he also talked about how you needed the generalist in the beginning. But as the company, as Netflix matured, you needed those uh, specialists and stuff like that. So I hope you caught that start animation. That's a kind of a recurring theme uh, when we talk about startup success uh, and, and stuff like that. But also... Uh, you, you talked about, you know, that domain experience, right? We, we see a lot of founders uh, that don't have that domain experience. And like you just said, like with the Instagram example, uh, you know, you don't necessarily have to have it all the time. I, I think some it, it's fair to say, though, right? Like there's sometimes like that outside not having the domain experience is actually an, a, a, an asset because you get to look at the same thing over and over in a different way, kind of like that design thinking you were talking about uh, a little bit, but I think sometimes people from the outside can bring a fresh perspective. Uh, is that fair yeah. to say, Tom? Uh, no, I, I love that insight. And I think it's, it's right on um, the Quincy apparel is a company I've just been talking about. Right. That, that pair of founders was inspired by um, two HBS students from the prior year had launched a company called rent the runway. Mm. Right. And, and um, a, a lot of your listeners will, will know the company started out renting party dresses um, and, uh, and, and it gradually transformed into also uh, renting work apparel. And then when they got a big enough base um, as a subscription product, you're back to Netflix, you know, like the original um, red envelopes for Netflix with, right. with um, Rent the Runway. Now you can have four outfits out at a time and you can't go get another one until you turn one of them in. Um, just just like the movies in the original Netflix plan. Um, and, um, those founders didn't have any fashion industry experience either. Um, and, uh, no question about it, sort of, they really, um, came up with a fresh idea, you know, the notion of, of will women actually rent, um, for a hundred dollars, an outfit that would cost a thousand dollars if you went into Bloomingdale's and, and bought the thing. And, um, People were skeptical, but they they tested it. They they ran um, fantastic minimum viable product tests, proved it would work, and um, and, and I think uh, it's the kind of idea that probably um, it had been harder to come out of the fashion industry and, and come up with that idea. I think the fact that they were outsiders, no question about it, um, gave them an advantage for sure. And they hired the people that could do the right procurement, of you know, course. buy the right dresses, so that they covered the domain expertise that way. And a lot of what they did was just sort of general, you know, pretty complex operations, warehouses and shipping things and customer service and so forth. But you could hire people um, who had done that before. It's not like you were sort of piecing together this complicated fabric sourcing, fabric cutting, um, quality control. So it, so it turned out in one example, domain expertise was crucial and the other was uh, maybe even a liability. For sure. For Entrepreneurship sure. is hard, man. It's, man, yes, it is. Thank you so much uh, for saying that, Tom. Do a quick reset here. Once again, Startup Nation, we're talking to Tom Eisenman, uh, the author of Why Startups Fail, A New Roadmap for Entrepreneurial Success. And if you want to pick up that book, Startup Nation, which I highly uh, want to nudge you in that direction, uh, we have a link there in the show notes for easy access if you listen to the replay on the podcast. I want to ask one quick question because we kind of talked about it a little bit uh, before we kind of move on. Because you talked about picking the right co-founder, uh, you know, when it comes to or co-founders, I guess, if you have like multiple people or something like that. You know, I guess I'm curious about what should that dynamic between co-founders look like? Should like one be a salesperson? I guess it's kind of like that specialist part a little bit, I guess. Uh, what should that dynamic look like in your opinion, Tom? Um, yeah. So so the first thing to say is I think there's a, a an assumption okay. uh, that a lot of people make that. Uh, you need a co-founder. Okay, fair and, enough. And, and um, 
And, and we should be careful with that assumption. I, I saw on your LinkedIn profile that you, you must have just had a conversation with Ali Tamaseb, I Super did. Founders. I did. Yeah. Um, his book is fantastic, Absolutely. by the way. Um, I, 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 have you had him on the show already? I actually talked to him yesterday. Believe yeah. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. so I talked epi- to him yesterday. Episode that'll be coming up um, by the time your readers hear this one, uh, they'll they'll have listened to that one. I, um, yeah. Well, so actually, he, it'd be, he, actually, it'd be flipped because his his uh, his book actually comes out a little bit later, so we'll release it uh-huh. at that time. So, well, yeah. that makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> yeah. Go yeah. Ahead, I'm so, sorry. Um, for for your listeners, Ali has done. Uh, a remarkable job uh, with data mm-hmm. of looking at uh, entrepreneurs who've built billion dollar companies and matching them with a random sample of people that built similar companies in the same kind of space, but weren't as successful. Right. And he asks all sorts of questions about um, what's the difference between the successful founders. It's, in a sense, it's the photo negative of my book, you know, where I'm, where I'm looking at the difference between successful people and those who right. failed. He's looking at the difference between super success and, and run of the mill. And um, and uh, he has data that basically shows there's no penalty for being a solo founder. You know, there's there's a lot of reasons to think that a solo founder um, um, has an edge in moving fast, right? If you have to talk every decision through with your co-founder, it's going to slow you down. And, right. and speed is a speeds a speeds a weapon for an entrepreneur. Um, that said, um, it does help to have a sounding board if you if you're doing anything as complicated as launching a business, somebody to sort of check your thinking. Um, and this is an awful lot of work to do. So you can, they can be team members, but sometimes a co-founder will be more committed and, and, and a better sounding board. So I think it cuts both ways. Um, right. But the reality is something like 85% of startups um, do have co-founders. 15% are solo founded. And, and the kinds of mistakes that um, um, you know, we see it with our MBAs, um, they have very similar backgrounds. Um, not surprisingly, mm, right? Um, right, right. Um, you know, it's um, the rent the runway founders are an example. You know, basically one had worked in investment banking, the other had worked in the hotel industry, um, but um, same kinds of schools. Neither of them um, could write a line of code, um, and and, um, and so you want you know the perfect world. Um, um, y- you want some overlap, but not too much overlap. Right. The the um, the co-founders of an, another group of my students, Cloudflare, um, went public um, a, a, a more than a year ago, now has a $27 billion valuation, which is kind of amazing. And the, the co-founders there talk about, if you imagine overlapping circles, like Venn diagrams, and when what, uh, there were three co-founders in that company, and they basically, he draws a picture of, you, you want to balance um, the amount of space that's not overlapping so it's big enough to cover a, a lot of different skills and 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 ideas, um, the different founders contributing different skills, but there has to be enough overlap between them that they can actually work together and communicate with each other. You know, so it's this balancing of how much is overlapping and how much is outside the, the Venn overlap. For sure. Um, and I think that's a good way of thinking about it. Complementary skills, complementary attitudes. Very often the case that one founder will be the outside person, sort of raising the money, um, right. negotiating with partners, um, really thinking through the brand positioning and so forth. And the other one will be inside working on operations, product development, and so forth. That's a great balance. For sure. Um, and um, where where it really gets tricky, so, so lack of, and, and shorthand for that, you didn't use the term, but I'm sure it's come up on the podcast, um, hacker, hustler, Balance, mm-hmm. right? The, the, the business person, the hustler, salesperson, and the hacker is the person who can really develop the product. Um, uh, some people will add a third H in there with his hipster, which is um, a great designer. Right. But uh, I think that's over. That's overdoing the H's in my view. <laughs> um, Too much alliteration, um, I guess. Yeah, exactly. Um, although I'm a big fan of alliteration. Of course, me so as well. The, the, the last, <laughs> the, um, the the last. Um, a uh, killer um, problem with co-founders is lack of agreement on who's the boss, mm. and, and and this is a tricky one too because in many startups the co-founders will work together side by side uh, for weeks or months before they bring anybody else onto the team. So in that kind of setting, it becomes perfectly natural to talk through every single decision with each other. 
and it's easy to carry that pattern forward once the team starts to get bigger and the business starts to get more complicated. And if you fall into that trap of feeling the need to true, be true co-CEOs, need to talk through every decision, you know, second guessing each other, or serving as a sounding board, it's going to slow you down. Right. And and, and ultimately, um, um, you can end up with fights. I mean, the MBAs I work with um, are all um, uh, convinced that they should be running something. Um, it takes, it takes a certain certain amount of confidence, and uh, and they often fight over who should be the CEO, and sure. and uh, you just got to sort that out. Absolutely. And and the 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 cowardly way out is to defer the decision, right? You know, we'll just keep running essentially as co CEOs and figure that out later. Well, the longer you wait, the harder it's going to be to 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 name one person. Absolutely. Well, let me ask you this quick follow up, if I could. Have you seen the dynamic of like maybe like a silent co-founder? Not like they're not necessarily technically a part of the company, but like the people, I they're always asking those people for advice and, and stuff like that. Have you seen that kind of like slow uh, uh, business growth or innovation and stuff like that as well in in, in your uh, you know in your career? Um. I, I wouldn't say I've, I've studied it enough to sort of have a, a view on whether it's a positive or negative. I definitely, I, I definitely know the pattern you're talking about. And there, there are some entrepreneurs out there who've had huge success in an earlier venture and realize what they're good at is spawning new ideas mm-hmm. and they will attract to them. Mm-hmm. Kevin Ryan um, is an example of this. He's an entrepreneur in New York. He started double click, which is the, the big win. Um, which is, is basically the technology now that Google uses to um, target and, and place advertising. Um, but he would then go, you know, he, he launched a bunch of seven businesses um, in very different things. Guilt Group, which was flash sales, was one of his, and, and uh, MongoDB, which is um, relational, non-relational database software. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, and, and Kevin's a co-founder. But he basically finds somebody to come in and run the show. But he's in the background, and you know, there to give guidance, and and um, and very much, very much part of the team. But as you say, sort of a silent member of the team. Right, for sure, for sure. No, because I, I, I see see people do like, I mean, like there's consensus building and there's too much consensus building. You know what I mean? And so that's why I yeah. was I was asking about that. I, I want to ask about those late stage. Uh, failure uh, points that you have, you know, could you kind of share those, the speed traps and stuff like that? Could you share that with us? Sure. Little? Yeah, sure. There's three of them. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, and I should say, wow, uh, when one of these late stage startups fail, um, it can really um, attract attention. You know, it's, I bet. it leaves a big, <laughs> big crater in the landscape when one of these things crashes right. um, because they're, they, you know, hundreds of employees, hundreds of millions of dollars often of, of investment in things. And, um, you know, this is Theranos. Um, this is if folks who remember back to the dot-com boom web van, um, pets.com. Right. Um, and so the, the three patterns are speed trap, help wanted and cascading miracles. And, and, and I'll, uh, I'll introduce each, um, quickly. Sure. Speed trap is just what it sounds like. It's, um, the company gets off to a good start. And then ends up going too fast, and 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 the speed um, it basically catches up to them for reasons for reasons I'll explain in a little bit. Sure. Um, but 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 along the way, the company has the lean startup folks use the term product market fit, um, which is just what it sounds like a product that fits the needs of the market and and can do so in a way that will eventually earn healthy profits. And and with a speed trap, the company has product market fit early on, maybe with early adopters, but loses it. And then you start to get a, a, a squeeze, basically. Revenues don't grow as fast as they should. Costs start to rise. Um, customers essentially become worth less than it costs to acquire them. And, and all sorts of other bad things happen that I can come back to. With Help Wanted, it's a, it's a different pattern. The company actually manages to sustain product market fit as it grows. It, 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 the, the, the demand is strong. The um, customers are valuable, but one of two things happens, hence help wanted. Um, either the bottom falls out of the capital markets and, and this company, which is still burning capital, but doing it in a healthy way, needs more capital at, at exactly the time when the capital markets dry up. Sometimes the capital markets shut down suddenly 
uh, just at the sector level. And clean tech went through this in the late 2000s. Um, biotech goes through it um, once a decade or so. Uh, the the dot com boom when when that all came crashing. Sometimes it's sector sector wide. Sometimes it's the entire economy, as with the Great Recession in 2008. And you know, so the example in the book is um, Dot and Bow, which was an online home furnishing company, um, like Wayfair. If you if, if folks are familiar with with that business, absolutely. And um, they were doing great. Uh, they had strong demand. Um, but um, just as they were revving up to keep growing strong and spending a lot of money on marketing, um, well-spent money on marketing, uh, the capital markets for e-commerce, this is 2015, um, shut down. Basically, a couple, of, a couple of companies in that space stumbled and investors got skittish and fled the sector. Um, and so to even the healthy babies went out with the bathwater at that mm, time and, right. and, and Dot and & Bo was caught in that downdraft. Dot and Bow was subject to the second help wanted um, problem too, which is while they had healthy demand, and it turns out to be brutally difficult to ship home furnishings around the country. And you're talking about couches and tables, big stuff. Right. And, and, and it's big enough that you've got to be home when it arrives. You take a day off from work. Right. And unlike your Amazon books, where you're delighted if they come two days early. You don't want your couch to come two days early because you weren't home from work that instead is, of sitting on the curb or that whatever. Is so true. Uh, and you, <laughs> yeah. And you don't want it to come two days late. It's got to be there. And and shipping couches without damaging them is just difficult. And this company, Dot and Bo, the, the uh, entrepreneur had a background in television, you know, and he he put some of the genius of 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 creating a sitcom to work selling home furnishings like the, the room was an episode and the, you know, the chair and the table were characters. So it was really creative and really right. well done. Um, and then people wanted the entire room because it all hung together. Uh, Urban Outlaw was one of the rooms. Einstein's library was another one of the rooms. A- and um, um, so he went through um, three vice presidents of operations trying to find them, including one from, we've talked about Netflix before, one with a Netflix background. Right. But it turns out that, you know, shipping little red envelopes is a lot different than shipping couches. That so is true. Uh, the, the, the first two didn't work and, you know, and, and that sort of, you end up with all sorts of customer service chaos. If, if you, um, if things don't arrive, people email you or call you, if you haven't staffed up customer service to handle the queries. And, and on top of that, they had um, the wrong CRM system, the sort of data, database you need to track inventory and orders and so forth. And, and, and they didn't really, they didn't have um, a website that was actually reflecting what was in inventory. So people would order things that weren't in inventory. They'd fail to order things that actually were in inventory. And so um, help wanted is a missing manager and a crucial specialty function. And, and, um, and if the entrepreneur lacks a background in that function, this guy didn't know operations. Um, you don't have a network rich with people that can fill that job. And you don't know how to spot the right person for that job because you've never done that job yourself or work closely with people who've done it. So that's help wanted. Um, and then the last pattern um, doesn't happen very often, but when it happens, it gets everybody's attention is a pattern called cascading miracles. And, and the notion here is these are audaciously bold venture concepts. Um, um, things nobody's ever done before that really um, tes- Tesla would have been an example. Um, SpaceX is definitely an example. So these things, these these bold ideas don't always fail. Um, Elon Musk is proof of that. But um, when you have an idea that big and bold, a bunch of things have to happen, each of which is uncertain, just fundamentally uncertain. Fundamental change in, in customer behavior. So the the case study that anchors this chapter of the book is Better Place, um, which was also in the electric car business. They wanted to create a network of charging stations for electric cars. And the secret sauce there was they were going to have stations instead of a gas station, a battery exchange station where a robot would pull out the depleted battery from your electric car, pop in a new one all in five minutes. They built this. They deployed the network in Israel and Denmark and raised um, and lost $900 million. And, uh, you know, so so a whole bunch of things have to go right. Customers have to adopt electric cars. They have to embrace your swapping concept as a way to relieve range anxiety. Right. Auto manufacturers have to design cars that are compatible with your swappable batteries. 
government has to subsidize electric vehicles. You have to raise a billion dollars. Um, you have to recruit <laughs> a team that can actually pull this off. You know, the, the government has to change some zoning laws to let you actually put the charging stations on the curb or 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 so forth. And um, and, and startup any nation one of those things. I was just going to say real quick uh, in startup nation. That is why entrepreneurship, just like Tom said earlier, is so hard. It's so many, it's, there's so many facets to, t- to take into account, but I'm sorry to mean to cut you off. I wanted to get that. No, 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 no. Just to sort of build on that sort of, you imagine there's five things that have to go right for the business to work. Right. Let's just say each of them is a 50, each of them is a coin flip, whether it's going to work. Right. If you, you, your odds of flipping heads five times in a row are 3%. Um, you know, same as the odds of spinning a number on a roulette wheel. Right. And, and that's where, that's the cascade of miracles. You need every one of those things to go right. And if one of them goes wrong, you can be right four out of five times and still the business goes down the drain. And sometimes it works. Federal Express was this kind of business, right? When Fred Smith launched Federal Express in the 1970s, it was the biggest venture capital startup in history. And people thought he was insane. Right. You know, we're going to put a package on a plane in Buffalo, it's going to fly to Memphis, and then it's going to fly on to Orlando. Like that doesn't make sense. Hub right. and spoke. Like we take it for granted now, but it was a new thing, Absolutely. and and people thought he was crazy, and and he nearly went bankrupt over and over again. He actually got pretty lucky because um, there was a uh, basically a strike that um, shut down U.S. Postal Service mm. for a while, and, and and people needed way to move packages around. Gotcha. So, so luck luck helps with an entrepreneur too, but. Um, so, so that's that's the third pattern, the third late stage pattern, cascading miracles for sure. And I, I appreciate the the Fred Smith reference. It's being you know here in Memphis, Tennessee, we're very very familiar uh, with, uh, with, <laughs> with Fred those, Smith. With those purple planes, absolutely. Matter of fact, uh, you know, I don't know if you hear them or not, but they're constantly flying over as we record this conversation. <laughs> no, as we speak, our house is kind of in that flight path. We're underneath the flight path. Uh, of yeah, the I'm, I'm I'm on the other end of one of those paths. I'm near one of the re- regional airports in Boston, not not Logan, but um, and the FedEx planes um, come come out of come out of this one. Absolutely, absolutely. I appreciate you uh, sharing that. I, I want to ask one quick question uh, and start transition. Man, we've had a, a fantastic conversation. Thank you so much. I I definitely don't want to keep up too much of your time, uh, but I, I want to ask two quick questions uh, really quickly. The first one is. Uh, the, I want to go back to the the speed traps a little bit. I'm I'm curious if you've you know run into or have seen uh you know uh, startups or or, or ventures kind of uh, fizzle out not just because of you know those things you were talking about, but more so it was like so successful. I'm thinking of this one company that had like this idea or they they had started it and stuff like that, where if there was somebody you didn't like. Right. And you would like fill this box up with like confetti or glitter or something like that. And you send them the box and like they open the box and they're like glitter will explode everywhere. Right. Like they actually had to <laughs> shut down because they was getting way too m- many orders. Like, have you seen many uh, of those examples or not so much? Um, it's yep, part of the speed trap is um, generating more demand than you can reliably fill. Right. And, and um um, you know, part of the problem here is when, whenever you got any kind of, I mean, some businesses are just pure software s- stuff on a screen, right? And those businesses can scale to millions or hundreds of millions of users. You know, I mean, it's not quite the bat of an eye. It's still pretty complicated to scale the server infrastructure up. But anything where humans have to do work, packing boxes, answering telephones, you know, think of Robinhood, right? This this explosion of of demand they had recently. Um, with all the day traders and the and, and the um, the Reddit crowd sort of getting excited about GameStop, right, um, right. You, you know, to bring on board people that can actually are trained to answer customer service queries um, when when demand is exploding is tricky business. And you drop the ball on that, you're going to get all sorts of bad customer referrals. And right. and, um, and and the longer it takes. Um, I mean, what Dot and Bo discovered as they were having the trouble um, responding to the queries is um, if you don't answer a person quickly, they're going to call again. So, right. so the That's emails true. and you know the, the, the responses actually stack up and you have to work your way through them. So they actually uh, push their customer service people to spend more time to nail it on the first encounter with the customer, You know, even, even though it sort of seemingly took more time uh, than, than just sort of pausing them. 
but yeah, absolutely the case that um, that you can grow too fast, right? You know, and par- par- another a related sure. um, a, a related problem that goes along with that is when you grow really fast, it's often the case investors will get excited about your company. Oh yeah, and they will give you more equity at a really high share price, which feels great um, when you get it. Like it's a lot of money and you avoid dilution of your equity as a founder. Um, But you're setting yourself up for a trap is basically um, you're probably going to need to raise again down the road. And if you don't sustain the momentum, you're not going to be able to grow at a pace that will satisfy the expectations of that, of that round. You know, and then when it comes time to raise money again, um, you're going to have a down what what entrepreneurs and, and VCs, venture capitalists call a down round. And there's nothing worse for a company. Um, you, you know, people who hold stock options will disappear, um, uh, be hard to attract new employees and and, um, and new investors will get nervous about coming on board, um, you know, and then the sharks will smell blood in the water. Right. They'll they'll drive a hard deal. Right. So uh, one of the reasons the speed trap um is what it is, is, is too much early success leads, sets the stage for failure down the road. And, and these things can unravel really fast. Um, w- once people realize they're in trouble. For sure. No, I definitely uh, appreciate you, you sharing that, uh, for sure. You know, uh, again, really quickly, one last question, but before I do that, I want to do a quick reset. Once again, startup nation, we've been talking to Tom Eisenman, the author of why startups fail a new roadmap for entrepreneurial success. And if you want to get uh, that book, which I highly suggest, cause I, I promise you, I have so many more questions, uh, but they can all be answered in the book. Uh, we have a link there in the show notes for easy access. If you can listen to the replay on the podcast. And if you're listening on radio startup nation, you can get that wherever Uh, you get your favorite uh, books. One last question, Tom. Thank you so much for coming on the show. You know, you're there. We're talking to you right now before your, I believe your student office hours uh, start and stuff like that. I I guess I just have a question for you as an educator. Uh, Can you name a time or think of a time where you or a student asked you a question and it just Either it, it not necessarily stumped you, but it totally kind of reframed your thinking about something maybe you had learned beforehand. Boy, um, you know, we teach by the case method at Harvard Business School. Mm-hmm. It, 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 almost every session is the story of a company and a manager or an entrepreneur facing a hard choice. Right. And um, what's different from a case method discussion from a lot of other forms of education. So if I do more than 15% of the talking, I'm not doing my job well, right? Gotcha. It really is a, it is a group discussion and, and I'm moderating it, leading it. And I ask a lot of questions um, and, and poke and probe, but much of the time the students are talking to each other. So um, I, I wish I could sort of pull a rabbit out of a hat and give you a specific example, but sure. I would say um, what you describe um, if it's going well, it happens a couple times a day where I, I work. <laughs> it's I really that. something. Yeah. I mean, you know, complicated problems with smart people, um, talking together, sort of exploring the problem. Uh, you get surprised all the time. I believe and, that. and, and so, uh, you know, if there, if there are folks in your, in your audience who are going to teach someday. I hope you'll explore the case method. It's, um, it, you know, and, 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 Part of the magic of it is a, a case method teacher can't be leading too much. You, you can't let it degenerate into chaos, sort of the of discussion course, go anywhere. So you do have to lead at some points. But but if I'm too directive, if I sort of go in there and sort of say, you know, here's the problem, here's the answer, the students will shrug their shoulders and say, okay, well, why do we bother coming? You know, you could have put that in an email. Um, so yeah, it's fun. Uh, and I love it. I love nothing better than being surprised by my students. I hear that awesome stuff. And that's going to wrap up this session of the startup life. Once again, we've been talking to Tom Eisenman, the author of why startups fail a new roadmap for entrepreneurial success. Tom, thank you so much for coming on the show. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Dominic. It was a lot of fun. No worries. And as always, startup nation, if you have an idea, be about that life, the startup life. If you want to let us know what you think about the show, have an idea for a show topic, or would like to advertise on a show, 
send us a message. Our contact information is there in the show notes, or feel free to reach out to us on Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram. Go ahead and follow us while you're at it. Follow us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Podcast One, or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts, and be sure to hit us with that five-star rating. We would really appreciate that. Be sure to check out the show's website and its startup blog, where either I or some of the world's best business minds share content that will give you the edge you need in your journey, whether that's the path of entrepreneurship or climbing the corporate ladder. Subscribe to our Patreon Patreon to listen to ad-free episodes, exclusive content, and digital products that we are beginning to offer. And if you want to be part of the conversation, join the Startup Life podcast on Clubhouse to have the ability to talk directly to some of our guests. And as always, Startup Nation, if you have an idea, be about that life, the Startup Life.